It's the 2025 opera season, and USC has their sights set on the future. Plus, I've got some more reactions to the Pac-12 death march. You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fight on, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Holkin, and thank you for making Locked on USC your first listen every day. Whether you're watching me on YouTube or wherever you like to download your podcast, we are free. I appreciate your support. You, please, show your appreciation. If you're watching on YouTube, become a subscriber. It's easy. It's free. Click the red subscribe button. And when you see that thumbs up, smash it. Hit it as many times as you can, often. And I don't want you to miss one episode of Locked on USC because we come at you Monday through Friday, five times a week. Hit that bell notification button and you will not miss an episode. This episode is sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com forward slash locked on college. Terms and conditions will apply. So the USC football team, 2023 version, they took off uh, Monday, day off from practice. Deserved. You know, they had a scrimmage over the weekend. I'm sure they had more than one. Uh, They've been practicing, you know, what? I think they went Wednesday through Sunday straight. No days off. It's all right. They, uh, They can take Monday off. But the recruiting season never takes a day off. I mean, there are times uh, when, you know, those dead period times, but all that really means is no in-person contact and campus visits are off limits, unofficial ones as well. But uh, when the 2025 recruiting class was set free, put into motion, sort of to be tagged by the programs who are interested in the recruits, juniors, these are, we're talking about players who are going into their junior season of high school, okay? These are where, this is who coaching staffs are now focused their energies. They're still working on their 2024 classes, but you have to look ahead. And USC started doing some big game hunting. They're looking for the guys in the trenches, those big hogs, both sides of the ball. So two guys on the same day got offers. One was, um, went to Pennington, New Jersey, Hun School. Four-star defensive lineman. His name is Cole Breeler or Breiler. B-R-I-E-H-L-E-R. Could be Breiler. <laughs> I covered all the bases. Uh, he had his tweet thanking the offer from USC, and he actually had Coach Nua tagged on this one. He's the number 276 overall prospect and the number 28 ranked defensive lineman in the 2025 cycle, and that's according to the On3 industry ranking. As far as the uh, New Jersey, he's the number seven overall player. More important than his early subjective ranking, you know how I feel about that, those star rankings. Uh, These are his early offers from programs such as USC, Michigan, Oklahoma, Rutgers, Penn State, Boston College, Minnesota, Illinois, West Virginia, Kentucky, Pittsburgh, Duke, Cincinnati, Maryland, Vanderbilt. I mean, as you can see, Got a pretty nice list going in the early start. And a lot of those schools I named, Big Ten schools. So if USC is going to be playing in the Big Ten, probably a good time for them to say hello (laughs) to some of the players and recruits that the Big Ten goes after. Ah, Let's talk about a top 100 guy in the class of 2025. This was the second offer that went out on Sunday from USC. And defensive lineman, from Port Charlotte, Florida. His name is Myron Charles. And he is considered the number four overall prospect and the number 11 defensive lineman in the 2025 cycle per on three. And the number 18 overall player in the state of Florida. That's high praise. Here's his early list, which is pretty impressive. Remember, early list. Offers just started going out for the 2025 class. He has 12 offers from SC, Florida, Louisville, Alabama, Oklahoma, Penn State, Miami, Ohio State, Ole Miss, and South Carolina. 
Once again, Coach Nua is the point man. That list is going to grow. And at the time of this taping, while for this episode of Locked on USC, let me give you, because there's just so many of them, I'm not going to be able to break it all down. Here is the total offer breakdown by position group for the 2025 class from USC to date. They have 12 running backs. Um, modern day running back Nate Frazier in the 2024 cycle, he committed to Georgia. USC has their sights set on Jordan Davison from the 2025 recruiting class out of modern day. And that's why, you know, USC isn't really that been out of shape uh, with only bringing in Brian Jackson in 2024. Don't forget, they got a couple of freshmen in fall camp already. Quentin Joyner, a Marion Peterson. In 2025, so far they've thrown out eight offers to the wide receivers. That's highlighted by Philip Bell from Mission Viejo. And on Sunday, they also threw out an offer to a young man is out of Ackerman, Mississippi, Choctaw County. I believe is the name of the high school. He's a four-star wide receiver. His name is Caleb Cunningham. Uh, it's a crowded field for his services. I wouldn't anticipate a commitment from him any in, anytime soon. I mean, right now, he's already has both the local schools in Mississippi, uh, Alabama, LSU, Florida State, as well as USC. Um, Lincoln Riley, Dennis Simmons, and Dave Remmerk. Those were all guys mentioned in his tweet. And Cunningham is the number 12 overall prospect, number four wide receiver in the 2025 cycle. So you can see why uh, that offer list, while well, it's short and sweet, it's got all the big boys. There's four tight ends that USC has made an offer to. I mentioned Jack Van Dorselaer out of Texas last week on an episode of Locked in USC. They made offers to nine offensive tackles. One of them is to six foot five, 270 pound Douglas Utu from Bishop Gorman. Um, there are 13 interior offensive linemen that USC has thrown out offers to. Among those include Champ, uh, forgive me, Tao, Tao Le, T A U L E A L E A from Valley Christian in San Jose. He's a four star. Jake Flores from J. Sarah in San Juan Capistrano, and Peter Lange from Archbishop Reardon, again, up there, Northern California, San Francisco. Combined, there are 17 edge players and 26 defensive linemen that they've given offers to. That's 43 total. And that shows a pretty big focus early on that they want to build up that defensive line. I mentioned a couple a few minutes ago, uh, in this episode, they uh, have given 20 linebackers an offer. One of them is from Modern Day, Nasser Wyatt. And on three has USC as a really heavy lean for his services. I talked about Noah McHale from Bonita High School out of Laverne, California. He was at one of USC's practices last week. And they've also given out offers to 15 quarterbacks, 16 safeties, and seven athletes. Right now, USC holds one commitment in their 2025 class. Out of Oxford, Alabama, four-star safety, Anquan Fagans, the name sounds familiar. His brother, Toy Quan, is on the roster this year. He's, uh, he's trying to earn rotation and playing time. But it hasn't, I'm not saying it's going to happen. It could, and it probably should. Anquan hasn't even taken a visit to USC yet. He hasn't taken any offers yet. He should take some, he hasn't taken any visits yet. He should take a visit to USC as well as to other schools. So there you go. There's your 2025 offers. Names, you know, I mentioned some names you should, you know, kind of jot down, but it's real early in the process. So let's not get too hung up yet on who USC has and who they haven't offered. I'm still focused on the 2024 class. The next two recruits that are in line to announce a commitment are Rush Edge, Jalen Harvey, and defensive lineman, Edric Houston. 
Uh, Jalen Harvey told Scott Schrader, WeRSC.com, that he's going to likely announce his commitment this month in August. And Houston, he's set, he's going to reveal his school of choice on August 22nd. Uh, I think the feeling is USC has a better shot with Harvey than with Houston, who many think that is a he's heavily leaning towards Ohio State. Houston that is. But that's what, you know, June, July, August commitments are all about. They're meant to be flipments once USC has secured a spot in the playoffs in December. And then lastly, a uh, commitment update. Uh, Salem, Virginia, four-star linebacker, Chris Cole. He uh, And he's been one of USC's top targets all summer. He announced his top six. And it's down to USC, Georgia, Miami, Penn State, Tennessee, and Virginia Tech. Here's the issue, the challenge for USC. USC's been trying to get him on campus for an official visit. And the plan uh, was to make it back to LA this season. It's just not sure if it's going to be able to make it happen. So, you know, USC's chances go up if they can somehow get you at can get Cole to make a visit during the season. He's set to make his announcement, though, September 10th. So if he delays, that might be a good sign. And before we close out this segment of Locked On USC, as you can see on the rundown, we've got more to talk about, including the uh, reactions to the end of the Pac-12. And you can see USC came out number six in the coaches poll. But before we get there, did you know, recruiting nugget, since 2002, USC has ended the recruiting process with a higher ranked class than Oregon in 18 of the 22 years, according to 24-7. We're using them because on three just celebrated their second birthday. They weren't around that for that long. Now, two of those years, Oregon finished with a number 12 ranked class and another at Number 13, USC was rated, had a number 63 ranked class and a number 70 ranked class. Well, if I need to explain Clay Helton and the sanctions, you're probably not smart enough to watch this show. I encourage you to stick around. I'll help you. But I don't need to explain that type of context to people. I shouldn't have to. There was another year, Oregon was number six, and USC finished number seven. So even when Oregon finished at number 12, USC was at number 13. Oregon finished at six, USC's at number seven. Mox, Knicks. Six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. I'm bringing this up now because recruiting reactions are starting to roll in with Oregon and Washington chasing USC. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. Kind of like, kind of like conference realignment. And you'll want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster, and they're going to do it for free. As easy as it is to find a job on LinkedIn... It's also just as easy to create a free job listing on LinkedIn Jobs. Once you've added your job listing, then take that purple hashtag hiring frame and attach it to your personal LinkedIn profile. And that's going to spread the word you're hiring. And LinkedIn's going to give you really cool, simple tools to use like screening questions. And that's going to make it really easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experiences so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and, more importantly, hire. Recruiting the right person for your team means a better product. It's why, it's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in recruiting quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com forward slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com forward slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Okay, just a real quick reminder 
Later today, as you're watching this episode of Locked on USC, I'm going to be at the Tuesday Trojan Club gathering. It's at the Cabrillo Yacht Club in San Pedro. If you can be there, get there. I'll be doing a Q&A around 7 p.m. You'll have a really good time. I encourage it. But let's get back to this episode of Locked on USC. The uh, Pac-12 is dead. We know that. Last, you know, last week, my everydayers, and you'll remember, I did a, uh, I did a segment where I came up with some headstones for their epithets, had some suggestions. Well, the reactions to the death of the Pac-12, they're starting to come in. And if, here's the thing, though: before the final nails into the coffin are hammered. Let's not forget, you know, that Oregon State and Washington State, Cal and Stanford, they're still clinging to their power five lives. Let's not write them off just yet. However, the Big 12 has uh, come out with a statement. I was kind of hoping that maybe they were going to absorb uh, the two state schools, Washington and Oregon State. Uh, but they... The, Currently, the, act, the, the Action Networks has a quote from the Big 12 that says they have no appetite to add any of the four pack four schools or San Diego State. Um, quote, we have no interest in doing anything, sources said. We're done. Now, on that note, it, uh, it looks like the ACC, they might be willing to absorb the two Bay Area schools. According to ESPN College Football Insider Peter Thamel, Sources, quote, did it, did it, did it, did it. in the next 24 hours, there's two calls for the ACC to vet and have early exploratory discussions on the potential addition of Cal and Stanford. One is for ACC athletic directors, and the other is for the league's presidents and chancellors. Here's the thing. Once you get to this step, it's, you know, it's basically just a formality. Um, Academically, Cal and Stanford fit the profile perfectly. There's no reason not to bring them. The issue at hand um, is the extra money that they're going to get joining the ACC. Is that going to help with those three to four road trips that those schools are going to have to take during the football season? We haven't even gotten to the basketball part and the other part, you know, the other Olympic sports, baseball included. I mean, that's a those are going to be cross country trips. What about the, uh, so what happens with the Pacific Northwest state schools, Oregon State, Washington State? I, I, I understand Big 12 posturing, but look how fast they scooped up Colorado and then the Arizona schools in Utah. I hope it happens. I think that's the right place for them. <clears throat> so I... I saw. I thought this was. I thought this was, was really interesting. The Action Networks. Brett McMurphy tweeted out this gem, and I, it, it has me wondering which school logo is George Klyovkov spitting at the most right now. This is what Brett McMurphy tweeted out. How committed was the Pac-12 to staying together? Following last Tuesday's meeting with Commissioner George Klyovkov, a Pac-12 president contacted a Big 12 president and asked if Big 12 could take all nine of us, except for Oregon State and Washington State, the source said. So here's the question. Which school president made that comment? Who made the phone call? Why would Oregon... Or Washington say something like that? Well, because maybe they wanted to make sure they were in line first to get a full share before they had to settle for that half share from the Big Ten Conference. Why would Arizona want to keep the Cougs and the Beavs out? I, I don't know. I, honestly, I can't think of a reason why either Arizona or Arizona State would want to keep those two schools out. It would help with their travel. This is a perfect example of the Pac-12's dysfunction. 
and complete lack of cohesiveness. And I'm, to be honest, I'm okay with it because I've always been USC first, everybody else second. I've never been in that whole conference rah-rah stuff, SEC, clap, clap, clap. Don't get it. Um, so, but it's also why USC was so vital to the Pac-12's existence. I, I, look, once USC left the island, literally, the Lord of the Flies set in and everyone that was left became piggy. Everyone. It was survival of the fittest. But my favorite to all of this is Oregon fans thinking they're getting over. <laughs> I call this, I call them the least sophisticated fan base in the conference for a reason. They're out there. Let me remind Oregon and their fan base. Your program is taking pennies on the dollar to stay relevant. That means you're half a person in USC's shadow. This is how Oregon fan translates. This is how it translates in their mind. It means the big, the big conference is showing them more love than USC. Hello, McFly. When you're only getting half, less than half of what USC is worth, you're not showing you more love. Remember, Oregon fan, you're a foster child until everyone feels you're worthy of being a part of the bigger family. You were shown pity. And I cannot think of a worse thing for someone to feel about someone than pity. I don't pity Oregon or their fans. I laugh at them. Not all of them. Just a lot of them. So the coaches poll was released on Monday morning. You're watching this episode of Locked on USC. First thing Tuesday. Thank you very much. Let me go over the uh, the coaches poll. I, I, I was going to take a picture and put it up. I apologize. Um, I'll go through it for you. Number one, Georgia. Number two, Michigan. Number three, Alabama. Number four, Ohio State. Number five, LSU. Number six, your USC Trojans. Number seven, Penn State. Number eight, Florida State. Eyebrow raise. Number nine, Clemson. Number 10, Tennessee. Here comes the Pac-12 again. Number 11 is Washington. 12, Texas. Number 13, Notre Dame. Number 14, Utah. Number 15, Oregon. 16, T excuse me, 16, TCU. 17, Kansas State. 18, Oregon State. 19, our friends, the Oklahoma Sooners. Lincoln Riley's favorite Christmas wish. <laughs> Uh, number 20, North Carolina, 21, Wisconsin, 22, Ole Miss, 23, Tulane, 24, Texas Tech, and number 25, Texas A&M. I am totally cool with the coaches poll uh, where USC is ranked before any of the games are played. And I'm, I'm cool with it because it gives us one more thing to talk about during the offseason. Just a reminder. Yeah. 18 days away, folks, from USC kicking off against San Jose State. Look, USC has the question marks on defense. The highest I would, I would literally, the highest I would rank USC is number five ahead of LSU. Because Caleb Williams is just that much better of a quarterback than Jaden Daniels at LSU. And I don't think anybody's going to question that. So, who, look, per the coaches and their assistants who actually do the voting, USC is going to be playing five teams that are inside the top 20. I mentioned those already. I think USC, excuse me, I think, I believe UCLA was in the receiving votes category. So uh, they're on the outside looking in. Of the top 25, I, rent, I mentioned my biggest eyebrow raiser was Florida State. They popped in at number eight. 
I mean, I get it. For the Florida Seminoles quarterback, uh, Jordan Scott, I believe is the name, is a Heisman candidate. But he reminds me more of a guy who, look, I just remember watching him last year. He either runs around and scrambles for a lot of yards, or he's just throwing it deep after scrambling around and getting the defense all dis disoriented. I'm not sure they're worthy of a top 10 ranking. I could be wrong. And someone explain to me why Texas A&M is ranked at all. Again, it makes you wonder, who is doing the voting? I, I don't think it's the coaches. This is a reminder of how the coaches poll started and finished last year for USC. USC started last season number 15. Then they moved into the top 10 into, at number eight by week three. USC eventually moved all the way up to number four in the week 14 poll. And that was why as they were heading into the conference championship game. We all know they ended up losing that game to Utah, dropped them down to number eight, and then they lost their second game in a row to Tulane, and they finished number 13 in the final coaches poll. Big whoop de doo USC finished the 2022 season as the number three team in the Pac-12. Washington led the way. They were number eight. Utah was number 11. That's how they finished in the coaches poll as far as the Pac-12 ranking is concerned. But again, none of this matters. The only poll that matters is the playoff committee poll and making sure USC is inside that top four at the end of the season. That's it, period, end of story, exclamation point. And that's also it for this episode of Locked on USC. I'll be back with another episode tomorrow. I'll have another practice report. And I'm going to have more on what's going to happen next with the Pac-12 tour, what's happening next with them, the Pac-4. So until that next episode of Locked on USC, everyone, you know what to do.